Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Uh, the following question is from Muhammad Bilal. Muhammad has three questions. His first question is, when we say that we fear Allah, do we mean actually fearing Him because He is God or should we say when we fear Allah, we actually mean to fear His set of punishment? Okay, let's see what the Quran says about that. In Surah Al-Nazi'at, Allah the Almighty says, uh, وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى This is one ayah. Second ayah in Surah Al-Rahman, وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّتَانِ These verses are talking about the reward for those who fear. Fear what? خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ the Maqam Rabbi he is standing before his Lord when on the Day of Judgment. So what does it mean to fear the standing before your Lord on the Day of Judgment? Because the standing on the Day of Judgment will be for reckoning, for the Hisab, for the Su'al. You will be questioned and uh, based on your harvest of your deeds, you will be either rewarded or punished. So because of that, the person behaves himself. The person who avoids committing sins and overcomes his own inner desire and so on. Why? Because he fears the day. He fears what exactly? He fears the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah the Almighty says in the Quran, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْعِقَابِ Fear Allah. Why? Because he is severe in punishment. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي إِلَيْهِ تُحْشَرُونَ Fear Allah who unto him you will be gathered resurrected and you will be accounted accordingly. So Allah the Almighty is the all forgiven and He is the most merciful. Meanwhile, He is severe in punishment. He said, Azza wa Jal, اعلموا أن الله شديد العقاب وأن الله غفور الرحيم. You have to understand, you have to be informed and acknowledged that Allah is severe in punishment. And meanwhile, you have to understand that Allah is ghafoor rahim of forgiven, most merciful. So with regards to fearing, what do we fear from Allah? We fear His punishment. Why? Due to transgression. And if the transgression is not followed by repentance, and if the sins were not forgiven, then the person will be due to punishment. Beautiful ayah that we see, اعلموا, know that for sure Allah is severe in punishment. أن الله شديد العقاب وأن الله غفور الرحيم And Allah the Almighty is also uh, oft forgiven, most merciful. The second question of Muhammad Bilal is, could you also refer to a verse in Surah Yunus where Allah says, the friends of Allah have no fear. Does this include the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are you talking about Ala inna awliya Allahi la khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun? Alladina amanu wa kanu yattaqun. These are two verses. You're referring to the first one which says that those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves because they strictly followed his guidance his instructions and the traditions of his prophet and they avoided disobeying him لا خوف عليهم there should not be any fear upon them nor shall they grieve uh, grief is with regards to the losses what happened in the past so they do not feel uh, that they lost anything because if they trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they know that what Allah chooses for them is best لا خوف عليهم The fear is with regards to the future. You're afraid of something that happens in the future. What do we fear of the future? Resurrection, the punishment. So at the time of death, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would assure them that they should not be afraid. 
they should be assured that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them as it has been explained in Surah Fussilat in Ayah number 30. When? Those who said our Lord is Allah and they remain steadfast on the straight path, the angels of death would descend upon them at the time of death to deliver this assuring message. لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون do not be afraid, nor should you grieve. Rather, you should rejoice of the paradise which you have been promised. 30 of Surah Fussilat. Why? نحن أولياءكم في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة ولكم فيها ما تشتهي أنفسكم ولكم فيها ما تدعون نزلا من غفور الرحيم. This bishara or this good news was delivered to them because they behaved themselves in the dunya. So accordingly, they feared Allah in the dunya, so Allah gave them security at the time of death and in the transient life which is known as Al-Barzakh, then in the hereafter as well. The scholars said, In Allah la yajma'u ala abidin amnayni wa la khawfayn. Very beautiful statement. I'd like to translate it. Allah the Almighty does not combine the two uh, situations or means of security for one person, nor the two situations of fear for, this, the, for the same person. Which means, whoever fears Allah in the life of this world shall receive security in the hereafter, beginning from the moment of death. And whoever is negligent of Allah's power, punishment, and uh, reckoning, so he doesn't fear Allah. A lot of, a lot of people say, I, I don't fear him. I'm free to do whatever I want to do. He's not afraid of his punishment. Such person will be deprived from security and salvation on the day of judgment. As a result of what? As a result of not fearing him. The fear is the quality which will make the person abstain from doing the bad. If it is something optional, without law and order, without punishment, without bearing any consequences, guess what? Everybody would do whatever they desire. I like this car, but it's not mine. I'm going to take it, even if I have to steal it. Why? Because there's no punishment. In Arabic also they say, Man amin al asa al adab. One who feels secure against the punishment, he misbehaves. He misbehaves himself. In the life of this world, it happened in New York City during the blackout. People broke out to the streets and broke into stores and they looted, you know, appliances and goods and all of that. Why? Because they felt secure from the punishment. They realized that there are no surveillance cameras. They will not be caught. The same people behave themselves in other times. Why? Because of uh, the concept of fear. They are afraid to be caught. They are afraid to be punished. They are afraid of the scandal. Right? The believers do fear, but they only fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do not fear the cameras, surveillance cameras, because they know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is 24-7 supervising them. وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ Allah is with you wherever you are. Uh, his last question, Muhammad Bilal, is, and mention when we say to the angels prostrate before Adam, so they prostrated except for Iblis. He refused and was arrogant and became of the disbelievers. He says if Iblis wasn't an angel, why did he have to prostrate to Adam anyway as he was not ordered to? He was a jinn. Well, number one, the Quran confirms the fact that Iblis is one of the jinn. And he was not but one of the jinn. He was not an angel whatsoever. Surah Al-Kahf. Explains that Allah the Almighty says, "وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ اسْجُدُوا لِآدَمَ فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسَ إِنَّهُ كَانَ مِنَ الْجِنِّ إِلَّا إِبْلِيسَ كَانَ مِنَ الْجِنِّ فَفَسَقَ عَنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّهِ." So the word except Iblis because he was one of the jinn and he was rebellious and disobeyed the command of his Lord. So now this ayah 
leaves no doubt that Iblis was one of the jinn and there should not be any further questions or discussion over whether he was one of the angels or one of the jinn because the ayah is very clear in this regard Iblis kana min al jinn fafasakan am rabb remains for us as how to understand the earlier context which is when we ordered the angels to prostrate to Adam fasajadu except Iblis does it mean that Iblis was one of them the same text is mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah and here is mentioned but with an addition that but he was of the jinn. So Iblis or Satan himself, the big Satan, was a believer, was a devout worshipper to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he chose to be that. And that's why he used to hang around with the angels. When Allah the, or the Almighty ordered the angels to prostrate themselves, Iblis was there. So when he did not prostrate himself while all the angels did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked him ordered him qala ma mana'aka alla tasjuda idh amartuk why didn't you prostrate yourself once I ordered you then Iblis my Allah's curse be upon him said he said that qala lam akul li asjuda li basharin khalaqtahu min narin wa khalaqt khalaqtani min narin wa khalaqtahu min teen then he showed his evil nature his arrogance because the other ayat he said istakbara he refused because he was arrogant he showed arrogance so the ayah says why didn't you prostrate yourself once i ordered you so he was ordered individually one more time he said and he confirmed قَالَ أَنَا خَيْرٌ مِّنْهِ I am better than him. He created me from fire and he created him from mud. So that explains that uh, Iblis was even ordered by himself afterward when he was reluctant or when he did not prostrate himself, when he did not comply the first time. Now when the order or the command was directed only to him and Allah questioned him, why didn't you prostrate yourself? He explained why and he showed arrogance. Uh, Muhammad Shariq, Brother Muhammad says in his question, I am 19 years old. I suffer from renal failure. May Allah give you shifa. I ask Allah, the great, the Lord of the great throne, to, to give you cure and recovery. Allahumma ameen. He says, my dialysis starts after us and ends after Isha. So I miss Maghrib prayer. My ass wudu becomes invalid due to some stomach problems and I pass gas frequently. Uh, am I allowed to pray without wudu because of my dialysis? Okay. Now you made a very specific setup. You say that you start the dialysis after us, which means you don't have a problem with praying dhuhr and us. The only problem is with the maghrib, which you're afraid that you may miss. You're one of those who are giving the concession to combine the two prayers now Maghrib and Isha at the time of Isha if you don't have a chance if you couldn't do it of course due to the dialysis and what you will be required is to make one single wudu for both and if this passing gas or breaking wind after the dialysis is something very frequent as you said and it's unavoidable then Basically, after performing wudu, you pray Maghrib and Isha, even if you continue to break wind and pass gas, and this wudu would be still valid for you to complete these two prayers. By analogy to a case which is known as urine incontinence, when the person fails to control his urination, um, or he's frequently dripping some drops of urine out of uh, lack of control over the sphincter uh, so in this case you will just make a single wudu will be able to pray maghrib and isha because it's already past maghrib time or past isha time and you can pray the two prayers with this wudu in the time of isha so what you will do is you will wait until you said after the dialysis you can pray maghrib isha adhan has been called make one wudu at your convenience then pray maghrib and isha with this wudu inshallah uh, brother muhammad ishaq delvi 
Is playing chess as a game without any sort of gambling allowed? Note that we do not miss our obligatory prayers. There is a difference of opinion with regards to the permissibility of playing chess according to what you said. Well, initially, they all agreed that playing chess uh, on money, gambling, betting is absolutely haram. Playing a chess to the point that it would waste the prayer time or divert you from attending the prayer in jama'ah because you're tied up to the game is absolutely haram. Uh, playing a chess and creating fights and hatred is absolutely haram. But playing a chess for fun and during your leisure time and without missing a prayer, without you know uh, keeping you busy from attending the jama'ah and fulfilling your duty, now there is a difference of opinion. Uh, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu an, Amir al-Mu'minin Ali, a mean of the fuqaha of the view that, you know, you're not supposed to play chess because it resembles idols. He said that, مَا هَذِهِ الْأَصْنَامُ الَّتِي أَنْتُمْ لَهَا عَكِفُونَ He said it when he passed by people who were playing chess. Like, you know, you are bound down before statues. So there is a difference of opinion with regards to the permissibility of chess according to what you said in leisure time without interrupting your prayer or any duty and you're not gambling. Uh, the following question is from Mariana Dibia. Sister Mariama says, what is the best way of doing dua? Is it to pray for yourself first, then pray for the rest of the Muslims? That's right. The best way to make dua is to begin by praising Allah the Almighty. Second, send in the peace and the blessings upon our most beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Then present your need before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You pray for yourself and for others. Allahumma aghfir lana wa lah. Allahumma arhamna wa arham. Oh Allah, forgive us our sins and him. Uh, have mercy on us and him or her and so on. So you can do that. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam indicated that Praying for somebody, which means in his or her uh, unseen, in their absence, has a great quality, which is that the angels would make dua, saying, O oh Allah, accept his invocation, accept his supplication, and give him or her likewise. So when somebody is sick and you say, in his absence, Allahumma shfihi wa afih, O oh Allah, give him shifa, O oh Allah, give her recovery, cure him or her, the angels would say, O oh Allah, accept his invocation, and likewise to the supplicant himself. Um, <clears throat> uh, the following questions, two questions, 19th and 20th, from Jihad, uh, from Algeria. Jihad says, what are the different religious views concerning transplantations? It must be either yes or no. <laughs> so it's either one. Mm -hmm. And uh, is the Samiri the Dajjal himself? Okay, with regards to tr organ transplantation, if we're talking about uh, during life number one, it is permissible with the following conditions. Number one, it must be absolutely free of any charge, donation, contribution, Number two, I'm talking about the donor, does not receive any compensation. Number two, that it must be done under the supervision of the professional physicians who will determine these procedures must be done before. Contemptibility between uh, the body part or the organ which will be taken from the healthy person given to the person who is sick uh, or he needs an organ. Let's talk, for instance, about a person who's having renal failure with both kidneys and needs one of the kidneys. Number three, that the donor would not be affected whatsoever. He can survive and live a healthy life with maintaining one of the two organs, such as the kidneys in this condition or the rest of the liver. And I have seen cases like that. I have seen you know, uh, some of our um, neighbors who attend the masjid, the son donated a lobe or a part of his liver to his father who had uh, cancer and his liver was entirely destroyed. So the son survived and he gave a part of his liver um, and he's 
functioning properly. So if this is going to save the life, guaranteed or most likely it would save the life of the recipient and it would not affect the life or the health of the donor and the donor is given it absolutely free of any charge and with all the tests of the contemptibilities positive then in this case it is permissible charging anything for giving a part of your body to a recipient makes the whole process illegitimate and invalid because you do not own your body parts to sell them they are owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is the opinion of the fiqh committees uh, in many places and this is opinion which I adopt myself with the previous strict conditions or lest it will open the door wide for the black market and the human trafficking as it is happening even in you know big countries and western countries and so on uh, the second question and it will be the last in this episode with regards to a samiri is he a dajjal himself the answer is no a dajjal has not come out yet and he will come out by the end of time and a dajjal will claim that he is the lord and a dajjal has one eye blind or wiped and a dajjal between his two eyes or on the forehead will be written a disbeliever while as Samari was one of the followers of Prophet Musa السلام, he crossed the sea from Bani Israel with him and everything and when Musa السلام, went to an appointed meeting with Allah to receive the scripture when he returned he found as Samari invented the calf and he carved the statue from the gold which he collected from Bani Israel and uh, manufactured it in a certain way so that whenever the wind would blow from one side it will come from the mouth as roaring or making sound so they thought that it is talking to them and this is how uh, he misled Bani Israel in the absence of Musa السلام, and when he returned he said فَمَا خَطْبُكَ يَا سَامِرِي so a Samari is the guy who misled Bani Israel during the life of Musa alayhi salam but a Dajjal has different traits as I mentioned earlier by that we come to the end of this episode and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us any errors or mistakes and to pardon us to guide us what is best Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima allamtana wa zidna ilma wa alhamdulillahi ala kulli hal wa na'udhu billahi min hali ahli nar السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته